in an economy in which the Fed's going to have to dump money and cause hyperinflation to deal with that, the one thing that has done well, gold and followed closely by silver, everybody knows that they're getting into it. They're de-dollarizing. And if you want to be able to buy food and drugs in the future and maintain your value as the prices of those go up, as we have shortages, gold and silver is going to counteract that because gold and silver absorb inflation. Gold. Hey everyone, this is Rob Keynes with GoldSilverPost.com, bringing you the weekly market wrap up as we do every week here on the channel. You can see this on our channel, GoldSilverPost.com, and for a limited time at JM Bullion's YouTube channel as well. We're recording this on June 16th, 2023. It's about 2 p.m. Central Time to timestamp it in case we get into things like prices. And we wanted to start off with the market. So looking at CNBC today, uh, overall, the U.S. markets are doing okay. Uh, we've got some green there. Dow Jones, well, actually some red. Dow Jones is now down 67 points, recently fell a little bit. NASDAQ down 81 points. Uh, S&P 500 down 11 points. Overall, the index is not doing too well. And it's basically, uh, it's about it's about a straight straightforward week for the stock market. Nothing sort of driving it forward or backwards. It's just hovering there because all this money slashing around the economy. Nothing to be too concerned about moving on to the cryptocurrencies. They seem to be stuck in the mud. Bitcoin is still in the $26,000 range. It's up $872 today, but it's up and down, up and down at about the same range. It's stuck in the 26,000s at 26,275 at time of this recording. We're looking over at some of the other ones. Bitcoin Cash is 10636. We see Ethereum at 17,1249. That's up 47 bucks on the day. Litecoin is up $1.48 to 7599 XRP is is usually doesn't move up or down all that much. It's not the most liquid of the cryptos. It's at 0.47 down a penny. And I don't see any other interesting ones. That's basically it. The bond markets are, are little too unchanged. And that's been the theme of the week as the Fed has decided to pause and then go back to some potential rate hikes. Uh, it didn't exactly explode the market, but it didn't crash it either. It's been sort of sideways trading. The two-year treasury sitting here at 4.725. That's not far off of where it was a week ago. The 10-year at 3.771. Again, not that far off of where it was a week ago. Still in yield curve inversion, still indicating a recession. Uh, and that'll do it just about for the markets. Not a lot going on there. Now, we did have some information on what's going on in the macro side. Um, we're still in that mid cycle deflationary period in a, a, an inflationary or a hyperinflationary super cycle, meaning we're going to see the economy start crashing down now and the Fed will react probably by tightening a bit, but if it goes too far, they're gonna loosen and that's where you would get more rampant inflation. I do believe also that food and energy prices and things that are absolutely needed will tend to have persistent higher inflation rates or at least less deflation of prices in the rest of the economy where people can substitute and say, I don't need that boat or that vacation or that hotel stay, or I don't need that new TV or that Xbox system or whatever the case may be. They're going to roll that money into the essentials, electricity, food, water, shelter, those types of things. So those things are going to have more persistent inflation through these these mini deflationary cycles, but other things will go down in price. Energy fluctuates a lot, but long term, I think energy is going to be up, even though it's down a little bit right now. Uh, initial jobless claims are sticky at 262,000. That's a carbon copy print from last month. It was expected to be lower, but I've been contending there's more inflation than the government numbers are accurately able to reproduce because of the statistical flaws they use in their sampling methodology and also their cyclically adjust or their seasonal adjustments, if you will. Those are very flawed. So I think employment situation is worse than the headline number and uh, tells us. And I think a couple of ways we look at that one, the labor force participation rate which is just the raw number of working people that could work, but with no modifications essentially. And then you got things like initial jobless claims, which are being sticky and high, which tells me employment's not really getting all that much better. Um, overall in manufacturing, we have a mixed bag. The Empire State for New York is up a modest 6.1 after being severely down the last few months. Philadelphia version of the survey yielded a negative 13.7. Overall, we've had a little bit of schizophrenia, but that's normal. The volatility ticks up as we head into a recession where some of the data is up and down. The reason why is the economy is dealing with deflationary environment at the same time it wants to grow. And so you have this sort of tug of war, but eventually uh, the, economy, the, the economy wins and uh, the market's not going to get what it wants there. In terms of capacity utilization measured as a percentage of the total output we could put out as a society, we slowed 0.2% down from last month to 796 that's over 20% of productive capacity in the economy is not being used. So when people tell me we've got a great employment and GDP situation, I'm like, well, how come 20% of our existing capacity is not used? And then 
we have to fill that up before we can grow. So I don't see this being long-term bullish on GDP. I see it being long-term bearish. We're not even manufacturing what we can right now. How are we going to grow that GDP? We can't because we have this huge debt overhang at every level, which is preventing us from doing that. And until we clear out that debt, that GDP is not going to rise. There was research done by Ro Rogoff and Reinhardt and their seminal papers and books, which explains that for every other major society they studied over time. I encourage you to go read that. We have an article up on Jam Bullion, which talks about that from a couple of months ago. Overall, I think uh, the economy is sort of moving sideways and we have the story of the week here. And that goes to the title of the presentation. People turn to gold as food and drugs get scarce. There's an article here talking about and quoting Pfizer executives and things talking about the lack of vaccines. A quote from this article, Pfizer will run out of several doses of penicillin, which treats syphilis, strep throat, and other infections later this year as shortages ripple across the U.S. supply chain. A different Pfizer penicillin, Bicillin C-R, that treats other bacterial infections but not syphilis, is expected to run out in the third quarter, which ends September 30th. Pfizer's penicillin has been in shortage since April. The company anticipates running out of the children's dose of the syphilis drug Bicillin L-A by the end of June, according to a letter Pfizer posted Tuesday on the Food and Drug Administration's website. The company says it's prioritizing production of larger doses of Bicillin L-A, which is recommended for pregnant people with syphilis because it is the only drug that can pass through the placenta and also treat the fetus. Of course, there are growing shortages of many other commonly used drugs, according to the article. For example, one recent survey discovered that the most cancer centers in the U.S. are accepting shortages of commonly used chemotherapy drugs. A recent survey found the majority of cancer centers are reporting shortages of commonly used chemotherapy drugs to treat a wide variety of cancers, the article points out. Much of the current shortage stems from the temporary closure of a drug manufacturing facility in India that happened after the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, found issues in the plant's quality control. In fact, the New York Times is telling us there are shortages of hundreds of drugs in the United States right now. Another quote, hundreds of drugs, I'm sorry, the New York Times, hundreds of drugs are on the list of medications in short supply in the United States, the New York Times writes, as officials grapple with an opaque and sometimes interrupted supply chain, quality and financial issues that are leading to manufacturing shutdowns. The shortages were so acute that they are commanding the attention of White House and Congress, which are examining underlying cases of faltering generic drug market, which accounts for about 90% of domestic descriptions. Another article on cocoa in terms of food, cocoa prices have soared 44% over the last nine months to seven year highs, the article notes as the global cocoa bean deficit worsens for the second consecutive year. Quote, the cocoa market has experienced a remarkable surge in prices. This season marks the second consecutive deficit, with cocoa ending stocks uh, appear to dwindle to unusually low levels. S&P Global Commodity Insights principal research analyst Sergey Chetvertakoff told CNBC via email, what about the basics? One food bank in Southern Georgia is warning they're facing a severe food shortage and they are desperate for help. Quote, we're just, we're experiencing the biggest food shortage we have in 40 years of food banking, CEO of Feeding the Valley Food Bank, Frank Shepard said. And it's pandemic related. It's really a number of causes. Our federal government and state governments provided a plentiful amount of food during the pandemic to help so many more people in need. And those supplies are just too slow to replenish. Then you have the whole supply chain issue. They're just taking three, four, five, even 10 times as long to get to us as they used to. And rapid inflation is affecting a lot of people, a lot of our donors as well. He goes on to end up saying, so it's really just a perfect storm, unfortunately, of circumstances that has got our inventories at record low levels. Food banks are reporting shortages. Major pharmaceutical companies are reporting shortages. Ladies and gentlemen, the, the supply chain challenges have not left. And they're going to be exasperated by the problem with the coming dollar as well. We're going to move over into the precious metals portion of the report. And I'm going to go ahead and present screen to you guys. And we're going to walk over 
what we see. We've got some really interesting results and in gold deliveries in the COMEX we'll get to in a moment. I wanted to show you the normal screen of we've got a little bit of renewed interest here in June in gold. We see that uptick right there, the last kind of three days going into this one. And this is Thursday's data. So the dominant contract month you can see is August. Remember, this is a futures market, not a present market. Spot prices are determined by what the traders both long and short anticipate the prices being in the next dominant contract month. So the spot prices you're seeing now are reflective of the risk the traders see between now and August. So it's the spot price that you see that you buy your gold and silver at and sell your gold and silver at today is actually where the traders think the price is going to be for 2023 because that's what the spot price is. It's the battle line. The longs want to go above, the shorts want to go below, and where they settle in the middle is the equilibrium point, but it's in the future, as you can see here. 365,000 contracts trading on August contracts, 1,793 added yesterday as people continue to pile into this month's trade. The EFPs are very robust at 54.12. Exchange for fiscal is where you take a COMEX contract here in the US and you go over to London and you try to get the gold or at least exposure to a gold position from a speculative standpoint or get physical delivery. The reason that's occurring is because these next two months in gold are not big delivery months. Only about six months a year are big delivery months in both gold and silver, and they're different with the exception of December. So right now in gold, it's August. And so you can't get deliveries because we're not in that contract month. You can trade the paper, but you can't get physical delivery. So they're EFPing over to London to get that exposure. That's Thursday's day to look back at Wednesday with the same thing, heavy EFPs over London 2072, heavy open interest 363,236. You can see people also lining up for October and to a greater extent December. I expect December to be the next big delivery month, but October can serve as an interim delivery month. And I'll get into why that's important here in a moment when I show you the actually physical deliveries on gold. That's why I'm emphasizing that and the EFP because you take all those numbers into account and it tells you how robust that gold physical delivery market is here in the US. When you look at all three, you got to look at them all. So looking here at the settlement data, that just tells us the price they settled at. We're looking at early data as of Friday, about 1.30 p.m. Central Time. It's always about 30 or minutes or an hour in arrears, but they do post nearly real-time data. So, so far today, 150,000 contracts have traded on the COMEX. In the August contract, we're up a half a buck to 1971.20. That's today's data. What was the trend from yesterday? Thursday's data has us trading less contracts, 266.353 ending up a buck 80. So gold is getting a bit of a bid at the end of the week. What's happening in silver? This is the silver chart, ladies and gentlemen, silver, Globex code SIN3, trading on the market. You can see silver has been elevated for the entire month of June, but especially since June 7th. And there've been a fair amount of deliveries here, not quite as much in gold, but you still see the EFPs. People are trying to get physical sil silver delivery in the current month. They can't do it on COMEX because there's not enough contracts to get that many. There's only 40 and 31 contracts. It's a, it's a, not a big delivery month for silver, a small delivery month. So, or not a big contract month, which means not a lot of deliveries because you have to have a contract to get delivery. It has to be secured through a contract. So they're going to do it for the next big month, which is July. And in July, people are, are trying to get exposure to that going through London to the tune of 2774 contracts. If we look at Wednesday's data, again, 2950 EFPs, 71,000 trade. Now you see people rotating into the next big contract month for silver, which is September. So for gold, it's going to be October. And then the biggie is going to be December. And then rotating out of out of July, eventually in silver, it's going to be September and December. You can see that here on the market. Going to the settlement state to see where silver is trading. This is as of Friday, again, 1.32 p.m., about 45 minutes ago, near real-time data. We had most of the contracts closing today so far on the July contract, JLY23 here. For silver, it's up about 18 cents on the day. Not too bad to close 24.12. And if we look at yesterday's data, it's pretty much the same thing. Dominant contract month is July, but it was down 16 cents. So silver is more volatile than gold. That's to be expected. Not any way abnormal. Talking about the dollar this week, because there were nine uh, nation states that decided to drop the dollar uh, and drop SWIFT, and they're using Iran's CPAN system. This is something that I wrote about on jambullion.com uh, blog and yesterday's uh, video on our channel covered this in detail as well. So I'll just go over it really lightly. Go watch yesterday's video if you want the full report on that. But nine Asian countries in, in a currency union in Asia, because of the sanctions on Russia and their affiliation with Russia and their trade, they're moving away from the dollar so that they can facilitate full trade and, and bypass those sanctions. And they're doing it using Iran's CPAM system in their currency. 
and they're doing that until they can develop their own. They're expected to have their own rolled out later this year. So Iran wins because we're using their currency system and they win because they're getting out of the dollar and they no longer have to deal with dollar inflation. They can go with that other basket of currencies. And I wanted to look at how do the dollar's done, the dollar index at DXY compared to gold and silver since basically Nixon took us off the gold standard. Why does that matter? When Nixon in 1971, which would be about right here on the chart, eh, about right there, somewhere in there, 71, you can see how gold and silver exploded after Nixon took the dollar off of the gold standard. You no longer could turn in your dollars and get gold back from the central bank or the banking system. They wouldn't do it. The dollar was free floating. The DXY basically was born. We were comparing the dollar to a basket of other currencies. Uh, those currencies include, if we can read those out, um, they include the Japanese yen. They include uh, the Swedish token or Swedish currency. They include the Euro and some others as well. There's about five others that are in there. And that is a measure of, oh, here we go. Uh, Euro 56%, Japanese yen 13.6%, British pound 11.9%, Canadian dollar 9.1, Swedish krona 4.2, and the Swiss franc 3.6. So the dollars bumped up against a basket of those other currencies. And you can see down here at the bottom, since Nixon took us off the gold standard, it's only been up 10%. So the dollar has risen 10% in comparison to the other world's currencies. So even though we for 52 years have had a monopoly on the world reserve currency, the US dollar has gone up by 10% compared to the other currencies. Why only that much? Because of all the inflation, the dollar is weak right now. And you can tell gold and silver have exploded past the dollar since 1971. This is the dollar. If you wanna know what's killing the dollar, the dollar's only been up 10% over 50 years. Okay, that's like a fraction of a percent per year. It hasn't moved. It basically has not gained in value. If anything, it's reduced in value when you account for inflation. It's actually plummeted in value when you account for inflation. And we know that gold and silver have done better. So if you had invested since 1971 in the U.S. dollar or you had invested in gold and silver, you would have been done a lot better in gold and silver. And I think the rest of the world sees this and they know the dollar's on its way out. And they're ready basically to do something about it. I think that's what's going to happen. Now getting on to the deliveries for the metal. I mentioned earlier we've had a big delivery month. And I mentioned earlier I was looking at the volume charts at EFPs. How many people are interested in metal now? Well, you can't deliver on these light months on COMEX. You only get a little bit. So you have to wait for the next big month. So they're taking these over to London. Why are they doing that? And why are they taking big deliveries? Well, so far in June, We've netted out almost 19,000 contracts of 100 ounce gold on the COMEX. This is a big delivery month. It is, in fact, the second biggest delivery month this year. April was the biggest at 24,330. You'll remember in April, that was right around the time that we started seeing bank failures. That's why people went after gold. Well, guess what? They couldn't get as much in May because there wasn't enough contracts in May to get big deliveries. They got what they could, 6,140 contracts of 100 ounce gold. But in the next contract month, we've had a healthy deliveries of 18,966. In fact, the first two days, and I did a video on this, we had delivered almost 16,000 contracts in the first two days. So people want their gold. Why do they want their gold? Well, it's probably because the dollar's done crap since the 1970s. You have Asian currency unions, Iran, Russia, China, and everybody else in the BRICS nation de-dollarizing you know, the share of dollars in world reserve currency has gone down to 60% now from 70% not too long ago. People are de-dollarizing, beginning out of the dollar, and they're going to gold and silver, and it's clear in the charts, and that's what's happening. And amidst supply chain shortages and currency crashes and all sorts of deflation uh, issues in an economy in which the Fed's going to have to dump money and cause hyperinflation to deal with that, the one thing that has done well, gold, and followed closely by silver, Everybody knows that they're getting into it. They're de-dollarizing. And if you want to be able to buy food and drugs in the future and maintain your value as the prices of those go up, as we have shortages, gold and silver is going to counteract that because gold and silver absorb inflation. Gold, for the most part, as we go along, with some exceptions along the way, but silver over time. Silver is more volatile, but when it goes, it tends to go all at once. So gold is the more stable of the two. Silver is more speculative, but silver will go up more during a major bull market. So I, uh, I always have a little bit of both personally. This isn't financial advice, so please don't take it as such. But that being said, I have a mix of gold and silver in my portfolio to deal with this problem that I'm talking about today. The shortages in uh, food and prescription drugs, two of the things we need to survive. Uh, amongst a backdrop of people de-dollarizing and the need to get into something other than the dollar, gold and silver are a great way to do that. All right, that's going to do it for the presentation today, guys. I got you the major news and economic data of the week. We went over the gold and silver markets and those dynamics. We talked about the long-term 
status of the dollar and how it relates to gold and silver and how you can use gold and silver to offset the tax of inflation and also deal with pr rising prices due to shortages because gold and silver allows you to save your labor and maintain that value wh whereas the dollar and other fiat currencies do not uh, stay tuned to next week we'll do continue to do this we'll continue to do the weekly market market wrap up every week so you are prepared and also a note we're on spotify and apple and google podcast and uh i believe odyssey as well or a lot of, of those podcast applications so if you're interested in listening to this on the go and you don't need the video, you can take that with you. Subscribe to our podcast. The easiest way is to go to Apple, Google, or Spotify, and you can do it there. And I'm sorry, the other one wasn't uh, um, Odyssey, was Anchor. You can do it there as well. So those four spots or wherever you see major podcasts, uh, you can download ours. All of our reports throughout the week will be on that. Till next time, this is Rob Keens with Gold Silver Post. You guys have a very blessed weekend.